that's what we're going to do in this series. We're going to help us. But before we do that, a few weeks ago, it was our 25th anniversary, and uh, I said, man, let's give God a praise offering of gratitude for his faithfulness to us for 25 years. And I thought, man, in three weeks, could we come up with, okay, if you're visiting, this will freak you out a little bit, but just, you can just tune this out. $400,000, okay, above our regular giving, okay, which is $18 million is what Hope will give this year for us to minister in our community and all throughout the world. $400,000 in three weeks, and you've highly disappointed me because you gave $455,000, and we haven't even gotten to the end of the month yet. Now, you would be sorely disappointed in me as your leader, if I said, let's just stop because we've already got 455. We've still got three days left because not only does it take $400,000 to actually get all the equipment for our new campus in Garner, uh, but to have the staff, the budget, the ministry this year is going to cost us about $650,000, so, uh, including the $400,000, so about $250,000 more. So let's go ahead and make a dent in that. I want everybody, if you haven't given yet, give something this weekend, okay? Even if you've given, you may want to double dip a little bit, okay? Take some money out of your beer fund, go ahead and give it. But as you're walking out at all of our campuses this weekend at the back door, you're going to have the opportunity to give. And I want to show you a little video of, of why it's worth it and how involved people are in helping us reach the community of Garner and start a new campus there. Watch this video. When we came to Hope a couple years ago, uh, we, were, we were actually looking for a little rest on our own. We've had kids since we were young and poor. Um, they're, we're now empty nesters. I was very excited about being able to travel. And then the Garner thing came along and I'm like, do we really have to do this? And I was like, it's going to take away from my trips and these things I want to see and do. Mike's preaching and he looks directly at me. There's nobody else there but me. So Saturday, 4:15, he starts saying, "You know, y'all have all these trips planned. You have all these things planned to do, but you know, you really need to commit to getting off the sidelines and just jumping in and serving God." And I'm like, looking around, and it's <laughs> like, "Oh, he's talking to me." So we got in the car. And I told Dave, I said, Daggummit. He's like, what? And I said, I just, I'm committed now. He just like, he didn't guilt me into it. It was the Holy Spirit. I know. That's it. We're serving in Garner. We're, We're doing in. it. When we got in the car and she told me that, I said, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> to love people where they are, you have to go to where they are. And, you know, Garner is just uh, uh, an extension of that. You're investing in the people of Garner when you do that. It's just not finances, it's, it is your time, it's your talent, it's whatever it takes, and it's, that's all in. There's no other church like Hope in Garner, and there are different ways to reach different people. And I think that maybe the ones that are in Garner that have not been reached, um, may be reached through Hope in Garner. The time that we put into it is just a small amount, but this has e e eternal consequences. As much as we say we love the people of Garner and we love Garner, they are our family, we do want to see them again one day. I know what God has done for me in my life. The blessings that we've, we've had, the forgiveness, the, the hope that we have in, the, in the eternal salvation. Everybody deserves a chance to hear the gospel. How cool is that? And that's why we go. I'm telling you, when we show up in Garner, there'll be marriages that will be saved, families that will be restored, people's lives that will be changed, and it's gonna be because of your generosity. Remember the first week of the year, I said that Jesus rides in to town on the back of generosity. Remember the big donkey and the little donkey? And you get to be a part of that. And so I'm gonna ask you to dig. There's several ways you can give. You can give online. You can give through the app. You can give at the boxes in the atrium. We don't take offerings on the weekend. If you're visiting, you just ignore all of this. But for those of us, listen, we're not a country club around here. We're about making a difference in our community and making an impact in the world. So be a part of that. Now this weekend, we're kicking off a brand new series. Don't get me excited. This weekend, we're kicking off a brand new series that we're called help us and in this series we're going to talk about how we can repair our damaged relationships because let's be honest we all have people in our lives that are tough to love 
Every one of us sitting here this weekend, we have someone in our life that's tough to be in a relationship with. And the reality is the relationship wasn't always this way, but somewhere along the way, the wheels came off. Somewhere the wheels came off and things started going south, and it could be your marriage. It's like, I mean, you, you stood before a minister and said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. And you're thinking that death do us part might become a reality. You know what I'm saying? Because you're about to kill each other. Like, what happened? Where did the wheels come off? How, where did we go wrong? It could be a parent-child relationship. It could be with a neighbor, it could be with a coworker, it could be with a friend, right? But at one time, it was an incredible relationship, but now you look at it and you kind of feel like it, it's a hopeless situation. And if that describes you this weekend, don't be too hard on yourself because uh, this is not new. I mean, think about this. The New Testament consists, if you've ever read it, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, which are the accounts of the life of Jesus. Then you got the book of Acts. And then you got the rest are a bunch of letters. The guys like James and John and Peter and Paul, it sounds like the Beatles, right, actually wrote all of these letters to churches that had been established 2,000 years ago in the first century. And these letters, if you read the New Testament, essentially they do two things. They taught people what to believe. And second, they explained how to love one another. That's really all they do. They tell us what to believe and they tell us how to love everyone. And uh, the reason is the main challenge in the first century, these churches 2,000 years ago, is the very same challenge that all of us face today. People just could not get along. And so these letters, they talk a lot about how to keep relationships healthy. Uh, in other words, these, these guys spend a lot of time describing what does it actually look like to love each other, to love one another. By the way, uh, just, just in case you didn't know, there are actually 26 one another's in the New Testament. Things like, you know, love one another, encourage one another, build up one another, rebuke one another. You're to pray for one another. You're to care for one another. But it's interesting, if you take these 26 one another's, you basically can put them into four categories. And these four things, if you focus on them, will help us change our relationships. Do you know what they are? We have to accept one another. We have to forgive one another. We have to submit to one another. That's a big one in this culture. And then we have to care for one another. And even as Christians, that's really easy to talk about, but it's actually tough to pull off. And so over the next few weeks, we're gonna be, we're gonna be talking about what would this actually look like in our relationships? But more importantly, I'm excited because I think this is gonna give us some insight as to how we actually impact and change the community and the world that we live in. And we're going to begin this weekend with what I believe is without a doubt the toughest one of all. We're going to begin with we have to accept one another. And let me just say this. When we use the word accept, especially around church, what we really mean is tolerate. I'm going to tolerate you the way you are. I'm not going to love you the way you are. I'm not going to take you the way you are. I'm just going to tolerate you the way you are. I'm not going to try to change you, but I'm not going to be your friend. I'm not going to hang out with you either, right? Right? So the reality is, is we're just tolerating each other, but we use the word accept because that, sound, you know, that sounds so much more spiritual, right? So let me just begin by giving you a definition of acceptance. It's this. Acceptance is the ability to receive another person without inner restrictions or outer requirements. Let me give it to you again. It's the ability to receive another person without inner restrictions or outer requirements. Now, the inner restrictions, they have to do with our prejudices. And let's be honest, every one of us sitting here this weekend, uh, we have something inside of us. There's an area inside of us that bristles when we meet certain people. Maybe they don't look the way we look. Maybe they don't talk the way we talk. Maybe they don't act the way we act. Maybe, maybe, maybe they don't think the way we think. Maybe they live in Kerry, you know, and you're like me, you live in Fuquay. You know what I'm saying? Just moved to Fuquay this week. And let me tell you what, I've lived in Cary and I've lived in Apex, but they know how to welcome you in Fuquay. In fact, check that picture out. When I got home from dropping off my U-Haul truck, Mike Lee for mayor and a goat, two goats in my front yard. See, that's a housewarming right there. That's how we roll in Apex, uh, in Fuquay. I see, that's how we do it in the Quay, right? But anyway, we all have prejudice, let's be honest, that keep us from accepting certain people in our lives. They're called inner restrictions. And then there are those outer requirements. And they have to do with behavior. They have to do with uh, performance. They have to do with certain expectations 
expectations. For example, some of you here, the reason you're struggling in your marriage relationship is you got married with certain expectations. What am I going to get out of it? How's it going to make me a better person? And some of those expectations aren't being made. And instead of just realizing at the end of the day, a marriage is really nothing more than a contract, a covenant between two people and God saying we are in it for the long haul, whether my expectations are being met or not. We gotta figure out how to make this thing work. I'm telling you what, there's no way Laura and I would be married 40 years if we didn't have some tough times where we figured out, nope, we made a commitment. We gotta figure out how to make this work. But see, all of us, we have people in our lives, let's be honest, that don't measure up to our expectations. And our typical reaction or response is to push them out of our lives until we're ready to get them back into our lives, which usually means when they get their act together, they can be a part of my life. But just as we heard Aaron sing earlier, by the way, don't you just love that guy? Yeah. (laughs) Acceptance means you're valuable just the way you are. That's what acceptance means. Now understand something. Acceptance doesn't mean approval. And this is where we get all discombobulated, right? Acceptance doesn't mean approval. It means that you're valuable just the way you are. I don't know what happened to our culture. There used to be a time in my life where you could actually agree to disagree. But now if you don't agree with what everybody thinks, you're a bad guy. You're a, you're a horrible person. You're a bigot. There's something wrong with you, right? But it just simply means, hey, we may not agree on everything, and I may not approve because I guarantee you, you don't approve of everything I do. I promise you that. But acceptance means you're valuable just the way you are. So when I talk about this today, I'm not talking about us all running out and getting one of those coexist bumper stickers. I hate that thing, all right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about us checking our discernment at the door. It just means, you know what? You're valuable to me the way you are, whether I approve of everything in your life or not. Now, why is this so important? It's important because as Christians, think about this. We have been called by God to treat people the way that he treated us. And it's because, see, as Christians, we've been invited into a relationship with God. And it's a relationship that's characterized by things like unconditional love and unconditional acceptance, unconditional forgiveness, things that are very, very rare in this world. In other words, as Christians, we get to be included in something that we don't deserve to be included in. And it's a relationship that's characterized by love and mercy and grace, and it is absolutely awesome. But then God comes along and says, okay, all of this great stuff that you have going on with me, I now want you to extend to the people that I put in your life. And just as you have been unconditionally forgiven, I want you to unconditionally forgive. I don't want you to forgive them because you think they deserve to be forgiven. I don't want you to forgive them because they've groveled and begged enough that you're finally going to forgive them. You feel like they've paid penance, you're going to forgive them. I want you just to forgive them because I have forgiven you. I don't want you to accept them because I've accepted you. And I want you to love them because I loved you. And I want you to serve them because I served you. I don't want you to respond to them the way you feel like they deserve to be responded to. I want you to respond to them the way that I have responded to you. And that's tough. That's tough. And so my desire this weekend is simply to give you a brand new lens through which to view the people in your life who right now are unacceptable to you. And maybe they're not acceptable to you because of your prejudice or maybe they're not acceptable to you because they haven't performed up to your expectations. But I want to give you a brand new lens to look through. And I'll tell you this, if you will begin to view people through this lens you will figure out what to do in your relationships no matter how complicated the situation is. Let me say one more thing about acceptance. The way God created us, he designed us to be acceptance magnets. In other words, our hearts are automatically attracted to environments where we feel unconditionally accepted. It's the way we were created. It is just the way that we are wired. For example, this, most of us didn't choose our friends. See, I didn't go around and say, I'm going to be your friend, and I think I'm going to be your friend. No, I'm not going to be your friend. No, I know you, but I'm going to be your friend. I'm going to be your friend. So we don't do that. You know what happened? What happened was we simply gravitated 
to environments of acceptance, and it was in those environments we actually found our friends. Ladies, let me tell you something about men that maybe you don't know. We are acceptance magnets. In other words, you take a man. If we are in an environment where we are made to feel competent, we are made to feel accepted, I'm telling you, it just pulls us in. And you ladies and men, I'm going to tell you some things about ladies too, okay? But ladies, you have no idea how strong that pull is. And this explains, ladies, why some of your husbands would rather be at work than be at home. Because at work, they feel more accepted. At work, they feel more competent than they do at home. I mean, they come home, everybody has their own opinion. Go figure, right? At work, everybody does what they tell them to do. And everybody tells them they're amazing and they're wonderful, probably just to their face, but that's what they're hearing, right? And men love that feeling and they don't want to go home. See, this is the reason that men and women have affairs. It's because all of a sudden, see, that home environment that at one point was so full of acceptance now has become full of judgment, now has become full of hostility, now it's become toxic. And let me tell you something, eventually your heart is going to go. It's going to gravitate to where you're accepted. See, that's why teenagers take the advice of their peers over their advice of their parents. It's not that their peers are smarter. It's not that their peers have more life experience. It's that... We are open to the influence of those who accept us much more than we are to the influence of those who just lecture us. And I realize as I say this, that some of you sitting here this weekend, you're in a tough situation because see, you are in a relationship where you are doing everything you possibly can to somehow win the acceptance of a person who just constantly rejects you, as, and it's impacted it's your self-esteem, and it's impacted and shaped your heart and your emotions, and your reaction has been to build walls and barriers in your life. But then you become a Christian, and then you begin to study God's Word, and then you begin to grow, and you discover that God says to us, oh, oh, by the way, I want you to accept people the way I accepted you. Which means we have to get out of the habit of only accepting acceptable people. It means that we have to break the habit of only accepting people that meet our expectations. It means that when we are wounded deeply by people we love and everything inside of us says, when you get your act together, I'll let you back into my life. Our Heavenly Father comes along and says, yeah, you got to break that habit because I'm calling you to a brand new standard. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Romans. It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, book of Acts, and then Romans. It's a letter that Paul wrote to a group of Christians in Rome. He had never met them. He heard through the grapevine what was going on, so he addressed some things. When you get to Romans chapter 15, if you don't have your Bible, we'll put the verses up on the screen. Uh, it's probably the best three verses in the entire Bible on this topic of acceptance. This is what he says, Romans chapter 15, verse 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul is writing this letter and he says, I haven't met you, but this is what I know about you. I know that you all come from different walks of life. I know that some of you are Young and some of you are old and some of you are male and some of you are female and some of you are slaves and some of you are free and some of you are Gentiles and some of you are Jews. But you know what I do know about? You are all following Jesus. You're all following Jesus. So you ought to be going in the same direction. There ought to be incredible oneness. There ought to be incredible unity among you. Verse 7, he says, accept one another then. By the way, when you accept someone, I'm an old football coach, okay? When you accept someone, it's like catching a football. And if you've ever played football they, they, and you were a receiver, what did they do? They teach you. You put your hands like in a triangle and you catch the ball and then you bring it to yourself. You don't catch the ball against your body because it hits your shoulder pads and bounces off. So you catch it, you bring it into yourself. That's exactly what this word means when it accepts. You, you receive it, you bring it to yourself. Paul says as Christians, that should be your habit. You should be in the habit of accepting. You should be in the habit of receiving and bringing others into yourself. And then he raises the bar in verse seven. He says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted 
you. Now, all of a sudden, it changes because that's a pretty high standard. Because a lot of you listening right now, whether you're online at one of our other campuses, you would have to admit, if you're honest, when I became a Christian, I wasn't very acceptable. But God didn't ask me to change anything. He just accepted me. And over time, things began to change. And so if I'm to accept other people the way God has accepted me, then I have to get into the habit of accepting people where they are. I have to get into the habit of accepting people before they change. In other words, I have to accept them where they are before they actually become acceptable. Look at how Paul put it in verse 7. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. Why? Well, here's the reason. In order to bring praise to God. Now, what the heck does that mean? It sounds pretty religious, but what does it mean in order to bring praise to God? Well, think about it this way. We praise people when they go beyond the norm. See? We praise people when they go the extra mile. We praise people when they overachieve. We don't praise people for just doing the normal thing. I mean, if you show up, punch in, do your eight hours of work and leave, you know, you don't get praise for that, right? But if you go beyond the norm, you get praise. No wife ever says, way to go, honey. You watch the entire football game. See, that, you, don't get, you don't get praise for that, right? Or, honey, I'm so proud of you. You're so special. You ate all your ice cream. No parent says that. Actually, probably parents do today. You guys are so weird, you young parents. But anyway, <laughs> you don't normally praise people for doing the norm. You don't give them a trophy for doing the norm. You praise people when they go above, they go beyond, they go the extra mile. And so this is what Paul is saying here. It is a really big deal. It is a really big deal. It is a huge deal that Jesus accepted you the way you were. Because let's be honest, you weren't very acceptable. And in the very same way, it's a really big deal as Christians when we accept people who disappointed us. When we accept people who have hurt us. When we accept people who haven't acted acceptable. And everybody gets credit when we do that. Because that's not the norm in our culture. In fact, you know what the norm is? As soon as you get your act together, I will consider receiving you into my life relationally. But until you get your act together, you're on the outside looking in. But I think God would respond, listen, I got big time extra credit. I got big time extra praise when I sent my son to die for unacceptable people and now I want you to do for others what I've done for you. Now, this is where it gets complicated, as if it's not complicated enough, right? This is where it gets difficult. Before, because for this to become a lifestyle, it means there are just some fundamental things in us that are going to have to change. And this is where some of you are thinking, I ain't coming back to this church. But let, we, let's go ahead and do it, okay? Because let me tell you what's really interesting about Jesus, okay? Okay? Jesus didn't come to this world to be right. He didn't come to make a point. That wasn't his purpose. You see, if Jesus would have come into this world just to be right, you know what he'd have done? He'd have gone around saying, you're wrong, 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 wrong thought, wrong action, wrong attitude, wrong motive, wrong, 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 wrong. You're all wrong. Who wants to follow me? Right? Nobody would have followed him. Right? If his business reason for being here was just to be right about everything, of course he was right. He's the son of God. He's holy. He's pure. Think about it. He knew all the answers. He knew the answers. He knew the heart of every man and woman. He could have just lined people up without them even opening their mouths and told them how wrong they were. But Jesus rarely did that. You know what he did? He walked and lived among wrong people. He walked and lived among sinners, but his reason for being on this earth wasn't just to expose how wrong everybody was. In fact, do you know why he was here? It was to build a bridge. It was to win our affection. In other words, he was here to accept unacceptable people. And now he says to us who are Christians, okay, that's what I want you to do. In other words, as Christians, 
Now, this is going to be tough for some of you. Our goal isn't to win an argument. Our goal is to win a heart. Your, your goal isn't to be right. Your goal isn't to make a point. Your goal is to build a bridge. Jesus said, I didn't call you to convince them. I called you to accept them. And I'm telling you, when that becomes the new lens through which we view our relationships, it has the power to transform our relationships just as God through Jesus has transformed many of our lives. But here's the problem for most Christians. We want both. We want to win their heart but we want to win the argument. We want to build a bridge, but we also want to make a point. We want to accept them, but we really want to convince them. Well, here's the good news. Both are possible. Because when you think about it, that's exactly what God did for us. But this is where we have to change. This is where we have to begin to think differently. But here's where the power is. If you want to accomplish both, then you have to focus on building a bridge, not making a point. You have to focus on accepting people where they are, not convincing people. You have to focus on winning a heart instead of focusing on winning an argument. And I'm telling you, when that becomes your focus in your relationships, you will retain influence, and maybe by God's grace, he will use you to change the person that you are so convinced needs changing. But I'm telling you, it all begins with accepting Because that's what God did for you and me. But that's a lot different than how most of us approach our relationship. I mean, I had couples come to my office. And they'll sit down and I'll say, how can I help you? And I'm telling you, 99.9% of the time, it's the lady that answers. Because the husband doesn't want to be there. He's come kicking and screaming. Coming to my office, it's it's like going to the principal's office. Nobody wants to come to my office, right? So how can I help you? I had a lady one time, this is what she said. I want you to tell him I'm right. (laughs) I've already shown him the verses. I want you to tell him I'm right. I've given him CDs, DVDs, MP3s. I've made him listen to podcasts and read the book. I just need you to tell him I'm right. To which I responded, well, you already told him that you're right. You think if I tell him that you're right, that'll fix everything? So if I tell him, hey, she's right, you'll walk out of here, your marriage will be fine. You know, you're going to be best friends. And her response is, I don't know, I really haven't thought about it that far. I just need you to tell him that I am right, right? This is what you need to think about when you find yourself in a situation like that. While you were still a sinner, your heavenly father decided to win your heart not make a point. He didn't try to convince you. He didn't try to build a case. He decided to build a bridge. And now he comes along and says, since I did that for you, can't you do that for the people that I placed in your life? Now I'm gonna be honest with you. Sometimes it's not easy. And there are no predictable outcomes. And sometimes it will get really, really messy. And you will watch people you love. And you will watch them make horrible decisions. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you from experience, if you will build a bridge, if you will choose to accept instead of convince, you will retain influence. And perhaps, and there are no guarantees, but perhaps God will use that influence to move that individual in his direction. But I will promise you this, and if you get nothing else this weekend, get this. You will never influence anyone who doesn't feel accepted by you. Let me say that again. You will never influence anyone who doesn't feel accepted by you. Let me give you an illustration. A few years ago, I was asked to speak at a conference. It was a God in the Workplace conference. And so how do you, how do you take your faith into the workplace? And it was at Summit Church and J.D. and I, we've been friends for a while. And so he asked me would I come and sit on a panel. It was a Saturday, and I didn't have a lot of time. And I said, I'll be glad to do it. And, and it was just basically everybody could just ask questions. Well, the panel was me, 
and the president of one of the most prominent seminaries in America. So me, it's like whipped cream on an onion. You know, sit beside this guy, right? Prominent theologian, PE major, all right? Very first question from the audience. If you're in the workplace and you have a friend and it's a same-sex marriage and you get invited to the marriage, should you attend? And J.D. said, who would like to answer that? And the seminary president took off. And he pontificated for about 15 minutes about you should not do that, to go means approval, you're condoning it, and da 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 and on and on and on and on. And, and then again, and, and he, he had biblical things, and I'm, I'm not, I'm just. So I thought, well, good, I dodged that one. And then J.D. said, Mike, do you have anything to add? I said, well, he's a little, little thing, a little thing, I'd say. And I said, I, first of all, this is, culture is getting more difficult. I understand that. And I said, I, I would not perform a same-sex marriage. So I'm just telling you that, okay. And I had theological reasons for that. And actually, in September, I'm going to do a family series, and I'm going to talk about marriage and one of the things you need to understand, the way God created marriage between a male and female is a representation of the Godhead on this earth. It's a theological reason. So it's not a homophobic reason. In fact, there are heterosexual couples I won't marry. If one is a believer and one is not, I won't marry you. Because the Bible says don't be unequally yoked together. And I just know you're heading for a world of hurt. Because you're not going to agree on basic foundational values if you're really a Christian. And so the Bible says, don't even go there. You're just going to, so I, so this is, I'm just saying, that this is a theological reason. But this is what I said. I said, I have really, really good friends. I've watched their kids grow up at Hope Community Church. And then later on, maybe when they went off to college, they, they, they said that they told their parents that they were gay. And, and I said, if, if they got married, they already know how I feel. You know, it's not about winning an argument or a debate. I said, but if they invited me, I would probably go. And this is why. You won't ever influence anyone who doesn't feel accepted by you. So if there's ever a crack in their life or an issue, I would hope that they would think, you know what? Because I feel like an uncle to these kids. Hey, Mike cared enough to come, even though I know he wouldn't perform the marriage. He, he, he thought enough to come. I believe I could talk to him about this area of my life, right? So you have to, you, you got to decide these kinds of things. And I said, it can get messy. But I know this, God has called us to be light. And if the light pulls out of everywhere where there's something we don't agree with, it's a dark world. I mean, let me just do a little test here. Raise your hand if you've never sinned. Any liars here? Just only raise your hand. No. So do we stop associating with each other? Right? I tell you, in 37 years, I, 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 I've seen and I've heard it all. I've talked to parents after their kids came out and they were like, I want nothing to do with them. You know, tough love. I've talked to kids who came out and because of the way their parents responded, the relationship was destroyed. I've talked to parents of pregnant teenage girls who are furious and she's on her own and da 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 and you know. I, I've, I've talked to spouses of addicts. Yeah. I remember one time I was on the phone with a guy whose daughter was getting married and the daughter and her fiance went to the parents and said, we need to confess to you that we've been sleeping together and we told you we wouldn't do that till we got married. And instead of the parents embracing them and saying, thank you for your honesty, the father would not give her away. He would not walk her down the aisle, you know. And I did the wedding, and I just thought how sad it was to see him sit there, but refusing to walk her down. I mean, that's stuff you don't get back, right? Right? I've seen it all. Let me just, let me tell you, this is what I've learned. In situations like that, who's right is not the question. It is not the issue. 
The question is this, how do I do for this person who at this moment seems unacceptable what God did for me when I was equally unacceptable? The question is, how do I build a bridge? How do I win a heart? How do I accept this person, not how do I convince this person? And I'm telling you, if that becomes the new lens, then you are simply obeying your heavenly father. And this is what you can anticipate. When you do that, when you live that way, see, this is what happens. You invite God in on the outcome of the situation. Because at the end of the day, we are his hands and feet on this earth. And we become for others what God has graciously been for us. Now, for some of us here this weekend, that's not that hard. This is not hard for me. I have lots of issues. This is not one of them. You ever take a strength finder? I'm taking Strength Finder. My top three strengths are woo. I didn't even know what that was. I thought that you went to parties and went woo, but it's not it. It's not it. It means winning others over. And I'm like, okay, I think I'm pretty good at that. Number two is harmony. Man, you put me in a room where there's tension. I'm like, oh my goodness, and I'm biting my nails. Like, can't we all just get along? You know, I mean, I, I want everybody to get along and love. Third, positivity. Lars said I need, to, I need to recheck that one as I've gotten old. But anyway, those, those are... In fact, Aaron that was leading worship this weekend, the first time I met him to interview him, we were sitting at the Mason Jar out in Holly Springs, and we were talking, and, I, and Laura was there, and his wife was there, and Laura said, have you taken Strength Finder? And he went through his strengths, and boy, they, were, they, were, they sounded important. I, couldn't, I didn't even know what they were. And then he looked at me, and he said, Mike, have you taken it? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, what are yours? I said, woo, harmony, and positivity. And he looked at me, and he says, you're a Christmas elf. be a bad gig. I'd be better in Sprinkle and Dinkle. I'll tell you that right now. Anyway, uh, so for some of us, it's just the way we're wired. This this idea is not that hard. For some of you, because I know you, and you live in this little black and white structured world, this is going to be excruciatingly difficult because I'm telling you, for all of us, there's someone in our lives that has the potential to so break our heart and so deeply disappoint us. And our tendency is to reject them instead of saying, God, this is my opportunity to give you praise because I'm gonna do for this person and I'm gonna treat this person the way you treated, you graciously treated me. Now, I know some of you are very, very uncomfortable right now. And some of you, you're not very happy right now. And um, don't email me. I'm not even going to read it. I'm tired. (laughs) I've been moving all week. But I believe this with all my heart. And I I don't think it's really that much different than what you want to believe. But maybe, maybe you're just afraid. Right? So this is what I'd recommend. Take a deep breath. Just relax. Let me, t- let me tell you something. We here at Hope Community Church are going to continue to teach the Bible as the inerrant, inspired Word of God. We're going to continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because at the end of the day, Romans 1.16 says that's the power that changes lives. We're going to continue to call sin, sin. I tell people all the time, I didn't write this. You didn't write it. I don't know where we think we get the freedom to decide, oh, that's not a sin anymore. If I walked in here one week and said, you know, I've really thought about it. I don't think greed's a sin anymore. You guys would go crazy, right? So we're going to teach sin is sin. We all sin. We all sin. That's just the reality of it, right? So we're going to, cont- we're going to continue to do that. I think you know by now. I don't give a rat's. Uh, I don't care much about what society thinks. I don't have a politically correct drop of blood in my body. So we're going to teach God's word as God's word. And we're going to continue to see lives changed. But hopefully without maybe some of the restrictions that keep people away. And let me just say this if you're new to Hope this weekend. You don't have to be something to be here. Okay. 
You can just be a sinner. Just like me. And just like everyone else sitting around you. And come on in. And we're going we're gonna to welcome you with all your issues and all your baggage and all your mess. Because you know what? God welcomed every one of us with all of our issues and all of our baggage and all of our mess. And we're going to love you where you are. And we're going to accept you where you are. We don't want you to stay where you are. Because we want you to experience the life that Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection made possible. An abundant life. A life that he created just for you. We want to see you be transformed. But I'm telling you, it all begins with acceptance. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for not just being right. And thank you for not just beating us down for how wrong we, we are. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. And I realize right now that there are some complicated situations represented here across our campuses, people who are watching online. I pray for every parent right now who has a prodigal son or daughter and they do not know what to do. I pray you would give them new eyes to see. I pray for every son or daughter who's alienated from their mom or dad because of a lifestyle they've chosen, whatever that lifestyle may be. And somehow they blame their mom and dad. Give them new eyes to see that it's really not about that. I pray that you would give us all a new lens to see that so that we can accept other people in their unacceptable state as you accepted us when we were so incredibly unacceptable to you. Remind us of Romans chapter five, verse eight, while we were yet sinners, not even interested in you, you gave your son to die for us. I pray that we will be for people what you have been for us. And you'll use us in the process. We love you. In your name we pray.